A reading from R vs. R, 1981, 28 SASR 321, Supreme Court of South Australia, Judgment per Chief Justice King. The appellant was found guilty by a jury of the crime of murder. The appellant killed her husband during the early hours of the morning of Thursday the 2nd of April 1981 by attacking him with an axe while he was sleeping. Her counsel at the trial sought to raise a defence of provocation, but the learned trial judge refused to leave that issue to the jury. The principal issue argued before us on this appeal is whether His Honour was correct in withdrawing provocation from the jury. The events of the night of Wednesday the 1st of April, which are said to have amounted to provocation, occurred on the appellant's case against an appalling background of domestic violence and ill-treatment. The deceased and the appellant, who is now 47 years of age, were married in 1954. There are six children of the marriage, five girls and one boy, whose ages range from 25 to 13 years. The deceased was violent, domineering and manipulative, being at all times determined to have his own way. He had affairs with other women and even brought one of them with him when he visited his wife in hospital following the birth of a child. He regularly used threats and violence towards the appellant and the children. Unknown to the appellant, the deceased committed incest with all of his daughters. The two eldest left home for this reason some five years ago. In the case of the daughter Denise, who gave evidence, sexual interference by the deceased began when she was six years of age, and actual intercourse began when she was ten. The deceased terrorised the girls as well as their mother by means of violence and threats. The tensions which existed in the home as a result of that conduct began to intensify when the daughters, Denise and Annette, returned from a holiday in Melbourne on Friday the 27th of March 1981. They indicated that they wished to leave home and go to Melbourne to live. The deceased reacted violently and refused to let them go. The deceased's bad mood continued over the weekend. On the Tuesday, following the violent scene, the deceased forced the three girls, Denise, Annette and Fiona, to leave the house. He then visited the appellant at her place of employment and created an angry scene. The appellant persuaded the girls to return. The deceased took Denise out in a motor car, leaving the appellant to worry about her safety. The deceased raped Denise in the car and inflicted knife wounds on her. When they returned home, the appellant saw the injuries. The deceased announced that there would be no more talk of the girls leaving home. The appellant did not sleep at all that night, and on the Wednesday morning she obtained a rifle from the house next door and bought some bullets. Later that morning, Denise told the appellant about the history of sexual interference with the girls. This was the appellant's first knowledge of that sexual abuse. It affected her profoundly. She said in evidence that she seemed to freeze up, everything went cold. She has little recollection of what occurred at work that day. She was alone in the house for an hour or two after arriving home from work. At about half an hour after midnight, the deceased and Denise arrived home. In the light of that recital of the version of the facts most favourable to the appellant, it is desirable to make some observations as to what does not constitute provocation in law. The loss of self-control, which is essential, is not to be confused with the emotions of hatred, resentment, fear or revenge. If the appellant, when in control of her mind and will, decided to kill the deceased because those emotions or any of them had been produced in her by the enormity of the deceased's past behaviour and threatened future behaviour, or because she considered that that was the only way in which she or her children could be protected from the deceased's molestations in the future, the crime would nevertheless be murder. The law of a well-ordered and civilised society cannot countenance deliberate killing, even to the extent of treating it as extenuated, as a response to the conduct of another, however abhorrent that conduct might be. Nor can society countenance killing as a means of averting some apprehended harm in the future. The law, of course, permits the use by a person of force even to the extent of inflicting death, if that is necessary to defend that person against immediately threatened harm. But the law has always and must always set its face against killing by way of prevention of harm which is merely feared for the future. Other measures, which are peaceful and lawful, must be resorted to in order to deal with the threats of future harm. Self-defence is therefore not in question in this case. Moreover, 
The history of incest occurring in the absence of the appellant cannot of itself amount to provocation unless they are spoken or done to in the presence of the killer. Although, of course, such words of conduct may be important as part of the background against which what is said or done by the deceased to the killer is to be assessed. In determining whether the deceased's actions and words on the fatal night could amount to provocation in law, it is necessary to consider them against the background of family, of family violence and sexual abuse. I have reached the conclusion that at least on the version of the facts most favourable to the appellant, it was open to a reasonable jury to take the view that an ordinary person possessing those characteristics of the appellant which rendered her susceptible might suffer, in consequence of the deceased's words and actions on the fatal night, a loss of self-control to the extent of doing what the appellant did. The deceased's words and actions in the presence of the appellant on the fatal night might appear innocuous enough on the face of them. They must, however, be viewed against the background of brutality, sexual assault, intimidation and manipulation. When stroking the appellant's arm and cuddling up to her in bed, and when telling her that they could be one happy family and that the girls would not be leaving, the deceased was not only aware of his own infamous conduct, but must have also at least suspected that the appellant knew or strongly suspected that, in addition to the long history of cruelty, he had habitually engaged in sexual abuse of her daughters. The implication of the words was therefore that this horror would continue, and that the girls would be prevented from leaving by forms of intimidation and manipulation which were only too familiar to the appellant. In this context it was, in my opinion, open to the jury to treat the words themselves and the caressing actions which accompanied them as highly provocative and quite capable of producing in an ordinary mother, endowed with the natural instincts of love and protection of her daughters, such a loss of self-control as might lead to a killing. A jury might find, to adopt the words of Justice Dixon in Parker, 1963, all the elements of suddenness in the unalleviated pressure and the breaking down of control as the night's events reached their climax in the bed. There was the effect of a sustained course of cruelty over the years. There was, moreover, the progressive build-up of tension and horror from the time the girls returned on the previous Friday. There was the intensification of the tension on the Wednesday night. The effect of the final actions and words are to be gauged in this context. There was, it is true, some interval of time between the provocative conduct and the killing, but in the words of Justice Windeyer in Parker at 663, passion and emotion were mounting, not declining. Some formulations, particularly in early times, of the rule as to provocation require that conduct to amount to provocation must be unlawful. It seems, however, that unlawfulness as a separate requirement has become obsolete. It is not mentioned in the classic formulation in Duffy, and has not been mentioned in modern cases decided on the common law in the High Court of Australia, the House of Lords, or the Privy Council. This is not surprising. In times when the criteria of provocation were expressed in terms directed to duels and personal quarrels among men who ordinarily bear arms, or to violence produced by violence, it was natural to include the unlawfulness of the conduct as one of the criteria. The modern cases, however, are not for the most part concerned with clashes between armed men, but with provocative conduct of a different type, very often consisting of matrimonial infidelity or wounding words and gestures, which conduct is frequently not unlawful. If the requirement of unlawfulness, which was considered to be one of the criteria of provocation, could be satisfied by a tendency of the conduct towards a breach of the peace, the requirement added nothing to what is required by the objective test as to self-control. If conduct as such as might cause an ordinary person to lose his self-control to such an extent as to perpetrate the violent act which has resulted in death, it must assuredly have a tendency towards a breach of peace. In my opinion, unlawfulness can no longer be regarded as a separate element in the test, and it is satisfied by a tendency towards a breach of the peace. The conduct in this case satisfies that element. Words and actions on the part of a husband towards his wife, which convey to her, as a reasonable person, the implication that the husband intends to continue an infamous course of domineering and incestuous behaviour towards their daughters, and to prevent them from escaping, must surely have a tendency towards a breach of the peace. I think also that it was open to a reasonable jury to conclude that this appellant did lose her self-control and that she killed while in that state. 
the ferocity of the attack and the words and actions which accompanied it, as described by the appellant, are suggestive of loss of control. The appellant in her evidence did not expressly describe her state of mind in terms of loss of self-control, but that is not necessary. Loss of self-control can be shown by inference instead of direct evidence. There is sufficient, in my opinion, in the circumstances of the killing and the account given by the appellant to enable a jury, if it thought proper, to infer that the appellant killed at a time when she had lost her self-control. There is, I am bound to say, a substantial body of evidence which tends to indicate that the appellant killed the deceased not in consequence of any loss of self-control, but in consequence of a decision made while in command of her mind and will, and motivated by hatred and by a desire to ensure that he never again molested her daughters. There is, indeed, much evidence to suggest that the decision to kill was made many hours before the fatal incident occurred. It is unnecessary to refer in detail to this evidence. It would require the careful consideration of a jury at a new trial. To say that there is an issue fit for the consideration of a jury is to say nothing as to whether that issue ought to be resolved in favour of the prosecution or the defence. Whatever might be thought of the cogency of the evidence, suggestive of the formation of an intention to kill quite independently of any provocation offered by the words or the conduct of the deceased on the Wednesday night, there is, in my opinion, material on the issue of provocation which ought to have been left to the jury. In my opinion, the conviction should be set aside and there should be a new trial on the information.